the firm that we represent is EHS Inc. As the logo tells you there, um, we are pretty much a safety training and consulting firm uh, specializing in environmental health and safety. So in a nutshell, we cover all four corners of the regulations when it comes to training requirements and even that important written program development, job hazard analyses, um, inspections, all that good stuff. Robert does a lot of that stuff as well. So if you need help with any of those services that OSHA requires, and if you want to be preemptive for a healthy safety culture, that's, that's really beneficial. We applaud that. Feel free to contact us. We are beyond compliance. Um, so we are a close-knit family. We take great pride and passion for safety. And there's a remarkable story uh, of the owner. If you ever have, have time to to hear it or view it, it's on our homepage, ehsinc.org. Take a look at that. And that's the reason why we are so passionate about safety. All right, let me go ahead and advance to the next. I feel like I'm gonna present take over, Robert. <laughs> All right, so about Robert, um, he's been with us for how long? How long have you been with the uh, EHS Inc? A little over four years now. Okay, cool. So what's great about Robert's um, background is he actually came as, as a tradesman. Yes. As an aerial lift operator? Aerial lift operator, uh, commercial roofer, that kind of thing. Wow. Carpenter. Fantastic. So he has that experience coming in, um, but he loves training. He's he's picked it up. He absolutely loves it. At least that's stuff I think he does. <laughs> um, but he's he's a great guy, and um, and we absolutely love him. And he's he's uh, he he just has a strong. I think he echoes the same passion as the owner about safety. Um, he's a family man as well as well as myself and, and the owner. So the ultimate goal is bringing you folks back home safely at the end of the day, right? So we can all relate somehow with that. But as that slide indicates, he has a plethora of uh, topics that he's well-versed in. Um, he recently got his OSHA 10 and 30 certification as, a, as an authorized trainer, which is huge for construction. And he'll be soon, hopefully, cro fingers crossed, he'll get his uh, CHST hopefully soon. That's a, that's a good acronym behind uh, the name there to have. All right. All right, let me go ahead and advance to the next slide here. Okay, so this is the cool part. So if you guys, uh, speaking of acronyms and certifications, if you folks have an acronym, CH, uh, uh, HST, CIH, CSP, what have you, and if you have that obligation, that requirement to have a certain amount of CEUs to fulfill the annual renewal, um, this, the good news is this webinar does um, offer one hour, uh, a contact hour. So depending on what association you guys are affiliated with, uh, that'll eventually turn into something. I think the average... I think the average algorithm is like 10 contact hours per one CEU. I don't know. It all depends on, on where you're from or where you got the certification from. So make sure um, if you do want to earn that one contact hour, um, I can go ahead and, and uh, send a registration uh, report to you. That's the proof of your um, attendance. Or I'm sorry, the attendance report to you. And that way you can go ahead and forward that to your applicable party, and they'll give you that one contact hour with the associations you see there, okay? All right, so I'm gonna, this is where I pass the virtual baton to Robert. Robert, the floor is yours, sir. Good morning, everybody. So, so today, obviously, we're here for uh, fire safety. We're going to go into fire extinguishers, a, a lot of common stuff, and then as well some uh, some things not a lot of people pay attention to. Everybody understands what an ABC fire extinguisher is. This is going to go slightly deeper than that. All right, so we're going to cover some applicable OSHA regulations fire sources, basically what goes into a fire, uh, fire safety procedures, the evacuation, that kind of thing, and the extinguishers themselves. And at the very end of the presentation, we have some kind of find the issue with this picture, hazard recognition photos. So obviously fires are a big problem, uh, not just in workplaces, but out in public. Uh, roadways, it seems like just about every field in California has been on fire recently. So it's a growing problem, uh, but you know, we're not just worried about property loss, guys, we're worried about lives that are lost, and that's not just the people who are in those affected areas, but also the firefighters that do have to go and put, risk their lives to fight these fires. So whatever we can do to assist, um, is always welcome, guys. Uh, the main purpose of this class and a fire extinguisher in general would be to to kind of control the fire if possible before the professionals get there. And if possible, even if it's a, a smaller fire, maybe extinguish it ourselves, I guess. So that's the main purpose of that extinguisher. Should never You, you kind of have to understand what extinguishers are rated for to understand what its capacities are, and especially 
uh, what it can do in, a, in the hands of someone who understands how to use it. And obviously, it, it's going to be very different from someone who has no experience actually using a fire extinguisher gas. Uh, so here are the latest statistics available through the NFPA. In 2016, there were 1,342,000 fires reported in the United States. These fires caused 3,390 civilian deaths, 14,650 civilian injuries, and roughly around 10.6 billion in property damage. So there they've actually broken it down a little further, talking about structure fires, which is the majority of the fires that do happen, 7.9 billion property damage. Uh, vehicle fires, so the ones like you see on the freeways and different things like that, uh, 173,000 were vehicle fires, and then all other fires, which resulted in 1.4 billion property damage, where 662 were outside and other fires. So these would be the fields and everything else like that that kind of go, go into the, the homes. All right, so rules and regulations. So the way it works, guys, because this is a generalized presentation covering federal regulations. A lot of the California stuff is pretty similar to federal stuff as far as uh, fire safety goes. But uh, even your state-specific programs may not outline exactly what the employer says. So you always want to go with whatever the stricter policy says. All right? OSHA's regulations are the bare minimums. The way I like to look at it is uh, OSHAs are there to save lives, and then uh, your company policies, if stricter then, are there to keep you from hurting yourselves or hurting others. All right, so again, this being a federal presentation or a general presentation, we're covering the general duty clause, which short and sweet version is uh, any place of employment, any employer has to give their employees a safe and helpful workplace. Okay? free from any recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause uh, serious physical harm, illness, injury, or death. Okay? It also says, because often people, uh, employers kind of freak out, well, I can only control uh, my employees to a certain extent. It also says that basically if you do your job and um, ensure that the employees understand what the regulations are and your personal rules are, they are required to have, follow those set guidelines. And you guys can also use that against them if uh, they aren't exactly following the policies. Um, so let's say if an accident never happened, then all you have to prove is that they were aware that these were the regulations, these were the rules, and it was their job to kind of uphold and follow those rules. Uh, so here are some, some of the guidelines that kind of reference uh, fire safety, fire protection, fire prevention. And different industries will have different guidelines and reason things like say general industry normally locations in the general industry will have some type of plumbed water source sometimes in the construction industry it's a new foundation new building area and there's nothing where you can actually hook up a hose to or anything like that so they'll go in deep into like fire protection portable uh, extinguishers things like that all right so fire source Everybody at this point has probably heard of the fire triangle. So this is an outdated concept. Um, it, I guess you could still consider it pretty accurate because a fire does take at least these three elements to occur, but it's been expanded upon a little bit. So initially, this is what the concept was. To have a fire, you have to have obviously a fuel source. Depending on the fuel source, um, what's feeding the fire, you're gonna need different levels of oxygen, more or less heat, and like I said, yeah, it's going to be dependent on what exactly it is that's burning. So fire, again, is is uh, these three elements kind of merging together and having a reaction, and that reaction is what we now know as this whole concept is known as a fire tetrahedron. Fire tetrahedron just added that chain reaction or the chemical reaction between the three elements, making it one of the vital elements of the fire. Okay. Now, usually people tend to think that uh, when the material is burning, it's the material itself uh, that's catching on fire. But if you actually look closely at something that's on fire, for example, um, like a chair or a table or uh, gasoline, for, for that matter, if you look closely at the fire, it's not actually the material that's burning. It's vapors that 
the material is releasing when it reaches a certain temperature that actually feeds that fire. And those vapors are what's actually <laughs> burning. Um, so those gases that are created when you heat up the material are what catches on fire, what continues to feed the fire. And as you heat up the material, more vapors are created. So it's a kind of, kind of a continuous cycle there. Uh, so again, the process we know as fire is a chemical reaction, which involves rapid oxidation or burning of a material of a combustible material. Fuel. All right. So usually when the word fuel comes up, people think of the gasoline, the you know propane, diesel, that kind of thing. But in fire, it's any material because just about everything can well, pretty much everything can catch on fire. You just have to heat it to the right temperature. Everything's going to release those vapors that I kind of talked about at different temperatures. That's why you hear the term combustible and you hear the term fl flammable. And really what it means is that flammable chemicals or flammable fuels, that type of material actually is easier to set on fire. So at lower temperatures, it's going to be ready to release those vapors. Where a combustible material kind of takes a little bit more work, a little bit more energy, a little bit more heat to get those vapors going. So typically solids and liquids must be heated to the point where they are, they are converted into a vapor or a gas before they actually burn. Um, usually when we do like a live fire session, we use something like isopropyl alcohol. And uh, depending on what you use to try to ignite that, that uh, alcohol, you may be there for a little bit trying to get the alcohol going because it's not creating the vapors enough. Uh, if you use a flare, for instance, it'll ignite right away. But if you try to use like a match or a... Uh, let's say uh, one of your barbecue type lighters, it'll take you a little bit before you warm up that alcohol and get it going. So the fuels what those fires depend on, you know, different fuels will require different temperatures, uh, different concentrations of those vapors in the, that oxygen to get it going. Oxygen, okay, the second component of that fire. Oxygen, it, it all depends on, again, what the fuel source is. It's in order to have a fire, the very minimum oxygen you need for the fire to occur, 16% oxygen. Now, if you've ever been to a confined space class or you're familiar with gas detectors or analyzers, uh, what you'll notice is that around us, we usually have around roughly 20.9, 21% oxygen. So usually oxygen is going to be present and that's not going to be a big problem. It's always going to be there. So that part at least of the fire tetrahedron it is, it's it's got to be present, right, for the most part. Uh, then after oxygen, of course, the heat. And again, the amount of heat that's going to be needed to create that energy is going to be different. It's going to be based on the fuel. Everything's going to be fuel specific. Everything's going to be chemical specific. Um, so a lot of this stuff in fire prevention, uh, if you guys are dealing with any chemicals, any different materials, uh, something that you guys should keep handy is like an SDS form specific to it. Because all these things are going to have different flammabilities, different combustibilities, uh, different ways of handling them or different ways of trying to put them out. All right? So, again, we are a general safety company. We do a lot of different things like that. This is just one of the things we kind of talk about there. But, yeah, keep those SDSs handy, guys. They're good, effective tools for a lot of different things that we have to do. Um, and I know I'm kind of getting out of the subject, but if you work around chemicals, a good section to have um, on that SDS would be emergency procedures. Let's say if uh, you get that, get that chemical splashed on you in your eyes, you ingest it, you inhale it, they give you immediate treatments to kind of do before you go and seek medical attention. That'll help the situation. But uh, again, heat, the energy needed to increase the fuel's temperature to the point where sufficient vapors are produced to igni uh, for ignition to occur. And if you guys are pretty familiar with that, that, that paragraph there basically gives you the definition of a flash point. Right? It's uh, temperature where once you heat it to that point, it's releasing those vapors to keep it simple. <clears throat> And again, chain reaction, guys, and that chain reaction is going to be specific to, again, the fuel, okay, because the fuel is what's dependent on that, that balance, and you need that perfect balance between these three elements to get that fire going. So chemical chain reaction, 
known as fire occurs when fuel, oxygen, and heat are present in the right conditions and amounts. Fire safety procedures. So this section kind of outlines how to handle when you first see a fire or if you hear an alarm or what to do in certain situations. Here we've got a fire action plan, which is a requirement for any general workplace. It can be, has to be accessible to the employees. Uh, if you have less than 10 employees that work at a certain company, then you guys can pass along the fire plan orally. They say like through a tailgate or a meeting of some kind. It doesn't have to be exactly documented. It can be passed around through a memo as well. But first things first, if you were the person who actually finds the fire, what your job is essentially to make sure that you're not, you're not the only one that knows about the fire, right? Because you don't want the fire to get out of your, your uh, out of control, and then um, no one but you knows, right? So if you discover a fire, you got to activate the nearest fire alarm first and foremost. Um, if it's something that's completely out of hand, guys, an extinguisher really isn't going to do much for you. Your job is then to kind of escape. Uh, let everybody else know on your way out that it is a fire because uh, sometimes, especially when you're dealing with like office personnel, um, if someone were to pull a fire alarm or something like that, normally they would assume it's just like some type of a drill and sometimes, and I'm not trying to say management doesn't do <laughs> certain things, but sometimes uh, we, we, to put it simple guys, we, we've kind of been desensitized to uh, alarms a little bit. If you guys are familiar with car alarms, when they first came out, um, even if your car didn't have a car alarm, when that alarm went off, it seemed like the whole neighborhood would come out and see what was going on. Um, nowadays, you hear a car alarm, and I don't think even the car owner goes and checks what's going on. So just to give you guys an example, we don't really pay attention to alarms all that much. Anymore. Remember that one in Hawaii where everyone got that notification that there was a <laughs> the false alarm? Remember that? <laughs> That's crazy. So, uh, so don't assume that everybody's going to understand that's a real emergency. Treat it as a, well, obviously it is an emergency. So you want to evacuate immediately. And I'm not saying go go out and put yourself in danger and go run into the fire area. But on your way out, notify everybody on your path. All right, guys, including supervisors, anybody who else who seems to be just stuck in their office. <clears throat> so, again, once you are evacuating, the concept of evacuation is to make sure that we know exactly who still who still may be in the building, who's not, and so we can let the professionals do their job. Let's let's get out of the way. So your job is to evacuate to whatever your uh, evacuation areas are, and that may depend on uh, what exactly type of fire it is, what are we dealing with, if it's chemicals, and it's something we don't want to breathe in, we probably want to stay uh, upwind from it. So different emergencies are going to require different evacuation areas, guys. You want to remain outside until the authorities say that it is clear or safe to re-enter um, and not allow anybody to run in after uh, the area has been evacuated. <clears throat> Evacuation routes. You got to have at least two. Be familiar with at least two exit routes from your normal work areas. And the reason being is that if uh, one of your, your normal evacuation route happens to be, uh, let's say, the area that is affected by the fire, you don't know any way out, now you're delaying that process. You're, going to be inhaling those uh, toxic fumes that are burning and being created by the materials that are burning. So um, you want to know at least two. Uh, don't just assume that the fire hasn't been to the location. Kind of test and feel the doors, see if it's if it's warm. Uh, I mean, you guys have all probably heard, seen or heard that before. It's touch the handle. Mm -hmm. If it's warm, it may mean that the fire is still there. Even if you don't see, you know, any visible uh, flames, because, uh, you know, usually what tends to happen is uh, the oxygen in the room may be exhausted. The fire may have exhausted all the oxygen in the room. And then when, when, if you were to open that door, it kind of feeds it a big rush of oxygen and creates a backdraft. So test your, your exits. Make sure that it's not warm. If it's warm, seek another exit. Know your emergency exits for your area. Never use an elevator as part of your escape route. And this, again, there's a lot of debate to this, but, uh, and I understand where that debate is coming from a lot. What you hear often is like, well, on high rise buildings, yeah, maybe the, the elevator would be a good escape route. And yeah, uh, but it all depends on your situation. Normally, if you're just like in a one or two or three story building, then your, your stairs are gonna be your best bet. Uh, if you were to be trapped in the elevator, so let's say due to a loss of power, 
that, that elevator shaft essentially becomes a chimney. Now you're going to be stuck in there, and more people actually die from smoke inhalation than actual fires, guys. So you don't want to be caught in that position. Uh, learn how to uh, activate a fire alarm. And usually what I find in uh, a lot of my classes is that everybody's pretty familiar with putting a fire alarm, either through uh, like elementary school or pranks in, in middle school or high school. So that's usually not a big problem. Just know exactly where those fire alarms are located, how to activate those. <clears throat> now, another thing that employees should be pretty familiar with are your escape plans, so your evacuations, right? And depending on what area you're at, there's going to be an exit that's going to be closer to you. So you want to just run clear across the building because that's the only exit you know. So you'll often find, uh, especially near uh, corridors or near uh, doorways, you'll find an a assembly area plan or some type of escape route plan like this. It'll outline, hey, if you're working in this area, these are the exits that you should see. These are the closest ones to you. So make sure that everybody's familiar with this, that's familiar, familiar with um, the lo locations of the fire extinguishers, uh, anything else that would be required during any type of emergency, not just fires like, say, uh, first aid kits, AEDs, if you guys have those on the premises, anything you guys could think of that's necessary during uh, an emergency. Note those locations on these maps. <clears throat> Panic hardware. Now, this all depends on what type of facility you're in, okay, because these aren't exactly a requirement at every location. Though it's specific locations where it would be required, let's say it's outlined in, um, and they'll, basically the guidelines say uh, it is required on egress, e egress is serving education on assembly or occupancy with an occupant load of at least 50 people or more, mm -hmm. okay? Or for all high hazard occupancy. So basically if uh, your place of employment is high risk, I mean, you know, there's a lot of different definitions to that. There would be, you know, high risk of fire, chemical exposure, that kind of thing. Then you're obviously you have to have some type of way of escaping and still allow the outside of the doors to be locked so as to keep people out, right? So that's what the panic hardware is. It's essentially doors that can remain locked from the outside, but that you don't have to struggle to get out of. You just have a quick push or pull or something that open up the doorway. So they're locked from the outside, but you can still escape. Um, but again, these are all going to be outlined in different areas like uh, the IBC, which is building code. Um, some different trades like electricians, which will have the national electrical electrical code, will have uh, specific outlines for different you know rooms that contain uh, high voltage areas, which is about 600 volts or more, or Areas even that are 600 volts or less, but have amperages or equipment that run on amperages and power amperages of uh, 800 amps or more as well. So there's there's a lot to that one there. Uh, <clears throat> stairways. So if you've noticed and if you've ever visited an older building, uh, especially really really old buildings, uh, all the stairways in older buildings were located at the corners of the building. So you literally have to run from one side of the building to the other, to the other, to the other, which would delay an escape. So now building, co building code requires that all newer buildings have their staircases, which are going to be the main evacuation, main out of the building, in the center of the building. So now you're running around in a tight spiral instead of having to run from corner of the building to corner of the building to corner of the building. <clears throat> Fire extinguishers. Again, I... People are pretty familiar with extinguishers and their components, guys. This is all just dependent on what exactly the extinguishing agent is. These are the most common extinguishers. So this is what you would find, like, say, on a ABC extinguisher, dry chemical ABC extinguisher. Here are the components there. Um, and, again, people are most familiar with this, the ABCs of the fire classifications, okay, which would be the most common ones, the one most people deal with. Now, these... I've kind of over the, over the time that I've been teaching these classes, I've, I've asked my students, hey, how do you remember what class of uh, fire you're dealing with, and how do you know what you need to put it out with? So, way that I've uh, that we've kind of figured out to teach this is that uh, if you want, if you guys want to pass along this information, would be a, a class A fire. So most people will kind of not understand exactly what a class A fire, uh, but just know that it's a common combustible fire. 
So this would be wood, paper, or cloth. And an easy way to remember these things is once they burn, an A-type fire leaves behind an ash. Ooh. Okay, so ash, anything that burns and leaves an ash would be an A-type fire, ash. Uh, B, flammable liquids and gases. Uh, this wouldn't be like your cooking oils or cooking grease or animal fats or anything like that, but it would be considered like, say, a petroleum grease would be a, a B-type fire anyway. Now, B-type fires, flammable liquids and gases, propane, gasoline, solvents, chemicals, that kind of thing. Uh, liquids, when you heat them up, they tend to boil. So that's a, a, you know, I mean, you guys could probably come up with a better one for B, but, but boiling is a, a good one, a good way to remember it. Flammable liquids, liquids boil. Now, C, C-type fires. Now, if it's just, to say, like a fax machine and it's not plugged in, it would still be considered like a common combustible fire because now that's plastic that's burning. Um, now, if it's anything really, electrical equipment, doesn't matter what it is, if it's got a current flowing through it, then it is a C type fire, electrical current. So again, you could use current as a way to remember that C fire. D, <laughs> and this is the one where I've kind of had a hard time figuring out how to remember this one or teach it so people could remember it. Common combustibles are uh, combustible metals, actually. Metals are uh, usually a heavier or a denser material. So it's a, you know, so <laughs> if you guys come up with anything better, hit me up on the comments. I <laughs> might have to come up with something that, that's fresh. <laughs> yeah, people. Now, um, cooking media, kitchen fires, guys. So, yeah, cooking oils, cooking fats normally happen in the kitchen. So that Cape Tide fire is just a kitchen fire. <clears throat> and then... Again, your extinguishers are going to have a lot of different information on those labels. Uh, I, again, people are most familiar with seeing the ABC extinguisher, which is, you know, multiple purpose, multiple rated. Uh, but that label is going to give you a lot of different information. Some of them will give you exactly what type of extinguishing agent is it. Uh, say, for instance, anything like a halotron, which is something that comes out liquid but evaporates quickly, it's a green green background. Uh, there's a, but as you guys can see, there's a lot of different ways of telling what type of uh, extinguisher or extinguishing agent you're using. Robert, we're at the halfway mark. You can take a sip of water if you want some in, but I'm just going to remind folks that um, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in on that Q&A. We had some late entries come in. I noticed you guys coming in about 10, 10 minutes after, so it might have been after the, the introduction, but just if you guys have any questions, utilize, you know what, utilize either the chat menu or the Q&A and type them in, and Robert will address them after the presentation. Thanks, man. Dry chemical extinguishers, as I mentioned, are the ones that most people are familiar with because these are the most common ones. Uh, they have multiple ratings, A, Bs, and Cs, so they can be used. It's safe to use on a C-type fire, which just means, like, say, you wouldn't want to use water on an electrical fire, and you guys can see and understand why, right? Water conducts electricity. You're holding, let's say, a water hose. You're probably going to get zapped if you're using it. So. These extinguishers are usually rated for B and C fires and can also be used as A, B, C extinguishers. It just depends on what the labeling is or what's in exactly inside the extinguisher. The CO2 extinguisher, one of the queer, uh, quick um, and easy ways of this, paying attention and finding out if this is a CO2 extinguisher that you're using is CO2 extinguishers actually will not have a pressure gauge. Because the CO2 works as both as the pressurizing gas and the extinguishing agent. So this would uh, this is um, basically how you know that it's full or not. You're doing the heft test. So similar to what you would do if you're uh, if you ever cook with propane and propane gas cylinders, you lift it up to know that there's some type of a weight to it, so you know that it's full, right? Um, and it's kind of easy to uh, determine whether or not it's got anything in there, or if, you know if it's it's uh, empty. Um, one clear area where you shouldn't use a CO2 extinguisher for a fire would be like in confined spaces because uh, mm. CO2 is a uh, gas that's heavier than air. And if you're familiar with it, if you get enough of it, you'd actually displace the oxygen. You move the oxygen out of the area. No oxygen for use in that situation. <clears throat> Class D extinguishers. Now, these you normally find like in areas of, uh, you know, firework manufacturing plants, uh, You'll find them in battery recycling plants, things like that, guys. And uh, these are extinguishers that are going to be usually specific to the metal. Okay, so it wouldn't be like an extinguisher that you can use on all flammable 
uh, or combustible metals. It's something that's going to be usually pretty specific. You guys see on that one that as an example, this one specifically can be used on magnesium, sodium, potassium, but um, there's a lot more flammable or combustible metals out there like lithium, for instance. Um, and that one would require a different type of extinguisher, or not a different type, same class, but different extinguishing agent. <clears throat> class K fires, so these extinguishers uh, in the kitchen, usually uh, they, these are like your backup plan. Normally, like big commercial kitchens, you're dealing with uh, in-place fire suppression systems, things like that, but these, uh, normally how they work is they have like a potassium acetate, which then when you use it and spray it over the grease, the issue with grease fires, guys, uh, cooking grease, is that these fires have been known to kind of reignite even at lower temperatures. They kind of change your chemical composure, I guess you can say, and they'll reignite at lower temperatures. So it's not about cooling it off. It's more of a kind of preventing, basically making a barrier between the fuel that's going to be releasing the vapors and everything else, including the oxygen. So how that potassium acetate works is that once you spray it over the grease that's boiling, it kind of makes a thick foam. The foam traps all the vapors that are accumulating. So no no vapors out there, no, no fire. <clears throat> so extinguishers, if you guys remember back to the slide with the tetrahedron, you take out one of the elements of the fire, there can be no fire. Okay, so the concept is you remove one of those and different extinguishing agents will do different things. Uh, your extinguishers can cool burning fuel. Again, if it's cooled down sufficiently where the material is no longer releasing vapors, no vapors equals no fire. If there's no, no oxygen or not enough oxygen, less than 16%, then again, no oxygen means no fire. If you make a barrier between that chemical reaction, like in the instance of the foam that we just talked about, you keep a barrier in between those elements, then they can't react and create the fire. So extinguishing agents will do one or a number of the, these different things. Now, I did mention the extinguisher is a great tool. If you can control the fire, great, uh, but your main purpose of the extinguisher is kind of help you escape more than anything. Um, you're only going to ever attempt to fight the fire if you're not the only one that's aware of it. Okay, so your first job again is to notify everybody, whoever's in in the building, and then have the fire part, the fire department on their way. Okay, because obviously things can get out of hand quickly, and um, extinguishers usually aren't rated for that big of a fire, guys. So you need to understand what these extinguishers are meant to put out. Uh, so again, fight the fire only if the fire department has been notified of the fire. The fire is small and confined to its area of origin. In other words, you saw where the fire started and it's only there. Not, hey, it started at this electrical socket, now it's on the roof and that other wall. <laughs> if it's spreading and spreading quickly, you should not stay in place and try to fight that fire. You're only putting your life at risk. And uh, it's better to lose property than lose a number of different lives, guys. Uh, if you have a way out and you can fight the fire with your back to the exit, again, your main goal is to get out of there and get out of there quickly. Okay, so if you're able to fight the fire, you should always be fighting it and kind of make sure that you still have a way to escape. And of course, you're only going to try to fight the fire if you have the right extinguisher for that type of fire and that you know and understand how to use it and use it efficiently. Because um, if you're not using it correctly, guys, all you're doing is um, delaying it and not really protecting or helping anything else. So you have to understand how to use it. Again, if you don't feel comfortable in using that fire uh, fire extinguisher, uh, things seem to be getting out of hand immediately, just leave the area. There's no real reason to be there if you are not going to affect the fire. All right, guys. <clears throat> so this is another thing that pe people are pretty familiar with, the PASS system which is just an acronym to help you remember the steps and how to use that extinguisher. There's a little bit more to it, but this is a simple way of kind of helping people be more comfortable around uh, and uh, more comfortable with the use of an extinguisher. So first you're going to pull the pin. Okay? That will then uh, allow you to actually use the handle and press the handle. 
you're going to aim at the base of the fire. So not at the actual fire, you're aiming at the fuel source. Because remember, again, if you aim at the fire, all you're going to do is lower it, but it'll continue to come back up once you're out of the extinguishing agent. So you go at the fuel source, put it out at its source. You're going to squeeze the handle, and then you're going to sleep at the base of the fire. And every so often, depending on what the material is, you're going to check it again to see if there's any um, sparks that are left behind, any, any ashes that are kind of still red, any embers really, and see if there's anything there and try to snuff those out as well. Um, do not ever aim high at the flames. All you're doing is wasting the extinguishing agent at that point. <clears throat> the locations for fire extinguishers. All right, so this is information on the, on the through the NFPA. They obviously you want to have these extinguishers where they can be seen, right? Because every second counts when you're dealing with any type of emergency. You don't want to have things like uh, extinguishers hidden. In, in, these are, by the way, these are some of the places where I've had found them in um, in uh, inspections that I've done in the past. Uh, you don't want to have them, like, say, under a kitchen table or in um, behind the supervisor's desk or, you know, if you, ha if you have them in those locations, you don't have them somewhere uh, <laughs> where they're hung up or in a cabinet or anything like that. Make sure that, at the very least, all your employees are aware of where they can find these things. But you want to have them normally somewhere cons conspicuous, somewhere where you can easily find them. There's a purpose to that red color, right? The bright red color just helps you scan the room quickly and see exactly where it's at. Uh, readily accessible for immediate use. So really there should be nothing keeping you from using that extinguisher, getting access to it. Uh, must be located along normal paths of travel and exit. So egress points really, guys. It's, it's ways of getting out of a building. You want to have them somewhere uh, immediately available in, um, under normal travel paths. Uh, it's going to depend on exactly what the the real risk of fire is. Like, say, if, if you're dealing with a lot more A-type materials and you're going to have them a certain distance away, no more of that. Uh, and then if you've got B-type materials, same thing, you're going to have them a certain distance away. Uh, again, do not block these extinguishers. If you have them blocked and no one can gain access to them, there's no point of even having them. Now, here on this information, again, provided by the NFPA, they have to be kept in designated locations when not being used. I've seen extinguishers that aren't used and being stored, like being left, like say, on the warehouse floor. These, these cylinders or these extinguishers are pressurized vessels, guys. So you don't want to have them somewhere where they could easy, easily be knocked over. Um, you crack these things. They could, if you guys have ever seen Jaws with the scuba tank kind of thing, this could essentially do the same exact thing. And, and not only that, the extinguishing agent's going to, uh, it's going to make it pretty difficult to breathe in that area, uh, even with dry chemical extinguishers. <clears throat> Must be installed on hangers, brackets, and cabinets, or on shelves. The, and here's where, where I, I know we will only put that information, that third bu bullet point. Top of the extinguisher, not more than three and a half feet above the floor. What they're talking about there is depending on the weight of the extinguisher, and the three and a half, not more than three and a half feet from the floor would be an extinguisher that's more than 40 pounds. So an extinguisher that's more than 40 pounds, the top of that extinguisher can be no higher than three and a half feet from the floor. Anything under 40 pounds, you can have um, no less than four inches from the floor and no higher than five three feet at the top. Okay, so there's, again, a lot of specifics to installation and locations. <clears throat> now, again, the idea behind the extinguishers and the placards and everything else is to easily be able, be able to spot where these things are located. Okay? So you want to have some type of an identifier, some type of an identification placard, sticker, something to that effect that will show you exactly where to look. Because normally when you're dealing with an emergency, you're quickly looking at a room. Um, and these definitely help in finding the, where the loca uh, locations of the extinguishers are. So again, I kind of brought this up a little bit ago. Fire extinguisher locations, depending on the fuel source, again, the fuel, your requirements are going to be a little bit different, right? Clay, class A or D extinguishers can have a maximum travel distance. Again, these are maximums of 75 feet or more through your normal corridors, access way, egress points, that kind of thing. 
Class B extinguishers, travel distance of 50 feet or less, and obviously the higher risk areas, you want to have them closer then. Uh, and then class C extinguishers, no minimum travel distance. Let's say if you have like an electrical room uh, where all your electrical equipment is in, switches, panels, all that other stuff, then you want to have a class C extinguisher immediately available in that room. <clears throat> now, when you see the label, Okay, the label has to have markings that are visible at least at a distance of three feet. That's someone with normal or actually perfect vision would be what it is there. Now, I, I do want you guys to understand with that ABC part of the label, but another thing that a lot of people tend to ignore is that one on the slide here, it says that's two. The information on that little bubble there that, or that circle where it has the two, start back at 10 feet, aim at the base of the fire. That's your max, maximum effective range for that extinguisher, and different extinguishers are going to have different maximum effective ranges. Uh, if you're dealing with like a fire that can uh, can splash, let's say um, like type B flammable liquid fire, you probably don't want to be right up close to it because if you cause that that you know I mean that sudden burst is going to affect some of that liquid, may cause it to splash. You don't want it to splash directly on you. So the point is to kind of start back at its effective range and. As it starts, you're starting to gain control of it, he's closer and closer to it. So pay attention to those on your on your extinguishers at your sites. Now, <clears throat> usually when, uh, when I do these classes and people have told me that they've done uh, fire safety classes in the past, I'll bring up uh, if they understand the, uh, essentially the maximum effective use of the extinguisher. These, these labels, the underwriter laboratory, they, they write, they give you kind of an idea of how big of a fire you could put out with that specific extinguisher. So here, as an example, we've got one A10BC, which is really, you're never gonna find those. You, you, you're likely to find like say a two, two A10BC or a four A80BC, things like that, all right? So what those little, uh, I guess what that little indicator or how they write that means, is in, it, again, this goes back to what type of fuel you're trying to put out, right? So if it's a, an A-type fire, which at this point you guys know that it's anything that leaves behind an ash, the easiest way to put out an A-type fire, something that we have commonly available, um, would be water, right? So when dealing with an A-type fire, for every unit of one on that underwriter's laboratory label, I say... For every unit of one, that extinguishing agent, even though it may not be water, is equal to one and a quarter gallons of water. Okay, so let's say if we had a 4A 80 BC extinguisher, that 4A would be, you know, that dry chemical extinguisher would be rated essentially to the same as if you had five gallons of water. Okay, and now that B, the B labeling there, the 10 in front of the B, it's, it's letting you know the amount of square feet of that type of fire material you can essentially someone who isn't like a let's say a firefighter someone who's uh <laughs> who has training on how to use it but not essentially a expert not a professional would be able to put out with that type of extinguisher so here they said 10 bc or 10 b rating the with that ex uh, extinguisher that you're we're using as an example you'd be able to put out a 10 square foot of a uh, flammable liquid fire. And then the C rating, all the C rating lets you know is that it is safe for use on live electrical equipment. Now, everybody's got to perform, if you're, if you're the owner of the facility, guys, you have to perform inspections on the extinguishers. And it's got to be done every month. And usually you, you see that uh, extinguishers have been um, taken care of by, say, a company once a year, but remember, we still have to ensure that it is a extinguisher that has not been used, has not been damaged in any way. So there are monthly inspection requirements for the people who are in those work areas. Every month, you must check for the inspection tag. That's how you document that the inspection actually happened. You put date, essentially just the month and day that you did the inspection. Uh, you're looking on your inspection, you're checking to see that the anti-tamper seal is there so that no one's messed with it, no one's used it. You're doing a weight or pressure check. If it's got a pressure gauge, you want to make sure that it is in the green area. Um, 
it, I mean, there's there's been plenty of times, guys, where uh, people assume, like, say, hey, I didn't use the entire extinguishing agent and think, hey, I could, I could just hang it up again and reuse it. But no, once you've actually practiced the seal where the pressurized gas is ex expelling the extinguishing agent, once you crack that seal, it's going to continue to leak. So it will not have that extinguishing uh, uh, propellant, the gas, okay? <clears throat> the extinguishing agent will still be in there. It just won't, you, nothing will come out if you squeeze the handle. So you want to make sure that, that it, it hasn't been messed with, and that, that's what the tamper seal kind of gives you an idea of. Waiter pressure check again, make sure that it's full, that it's got the, the extinguishing agent or, and or it's got, um, or it's pressurized. Uh, look for any damage or missing parts. Okay, so normally people will leave them on the hanger or on the in the cabinet. The point is to ensure that the shell hasn't been compromised in any way. So you're looking for any cracks, any rusting, any corrosion, any pitting, anything that makes that extinguisher unsafe for use. Because there have been people who have, um, let's say, left a uh, extinguisher in place on a rack for years and years on end. And they're working in an area where there's like a lot of humidity or a lot of different conditions where rusting just tends to happen with all the different metals. And uh, what, when they actually try to use these extinguishers, the rust of the bottom may be rusted out. And since it's a high pressure thing, once you've squeezed that, that handle, um, there have been cases where the bottom just completely blows out. And you obviously aren't going to have use of that extinguisher then. So ensure that your extinguishers are safe for use, guys. And I mentioned these extinguishers have to have someone service them at least once a year uh, to ensure that they're good. Uh, anything that's been used has to be refilled, and it only can be done by someone who is trained or certified in repair, replacement, that kind of thing. <clears throat> now, they're also going to do a hydrostatic test depending on what type of uh, shell the extinguisher is made out of they're going to have different testing intervals. So the most, most common one would be, let's say we, we're talking about dry chemical extinguishers, stored pressure, uh, mild steel, braze, that kind of thing, aluminum shells. So to have a service life of, say, or a hydrostatic test interval of 12 years. So what they normally do is kind of etch it into the shell and let you know, hey, the last hydrostatic test date was this. And if it's been more than 12 years, no one's going to refill it for you until it's been hydrostatically tested again. And this doesn't just apply to extinguishers. It's any, any gas cylinders. Now, the last portion of the presentation, guys, we've got hazard recognition photos. All right, so now based on what you've seen in the presentation, I want to see, you know, I want you to recognize what's wrong with the picture. All right, so these oftentimes are pretty funny. So this next upcoming one, what do you guys see wrong with this picture? Um, obviously, if there was a fire, there's going to be a pretty, everybody's going to have a difficult time trying to gain access to that extinguisher. Uh, um, I've seen this once in the past, um, but it was at a location where um, the company had a second floor, like a mezzanine, and uh, they had a, <laughs> they actually had the identifier, the label, that had the arrow on the steel beam, but it was pointing up instead of pointing down. <laughs> That's so I didn't get a picture of it. It was just so funny. It was during an aerial lift class, too. <laughs> <laughs> so in order to reach that extinguisher, you needed an aerial lift. Aerial lift, yeah. <laughs> now, fire safety plan. If you guys have noticed, and you oh might goodness. have heard me mention this before, this fire safety plan is essentially your go-to. Hey, how do we handle storing of flammable chemicals? How do we, you know, inspect different... Uh, let's say, areas that run with uh, flammable gases or it's your evacuation plans and everything, how to do <laughs> everything basically that you need during a fire emergency is in this cabinet. Remember, one of the requirements being that employees have to have an access to them, right? If you've got 10 or more, it's got to be a written plan and <laughs> 10 or more employees, and they have to have access. You can't just say, okay, well, we'll, we'll kind of cover it eventually. <clears throat> Anything wrong with this picture, guys? And this, talking to guys in different uh, companies or different industries, you'll, this is actually, I mean, common sense tells you you don't want to have any gas cylinders here. It looks like it's like an acetylene tank and an oxygen tank, which you would use like for oxyacetylene welding, uh, which is basically you're welding with fire instead of anything else. 
Yeah, you wouldn't want any spark producing operations going towards there, right? So there are it, what we've talked to talked about at this point is uh, up to this point has been you know general fire safety, but there's a lot more to it. There's hot work requirements, guys. Where um, basically you have to keep all flammable equipment, flammable materials, combustibles, whenever there is any hot work being done, at least 30 feet. 35 feet away, anything that you can remove from the area to clean up, you got to keep those areas 35, uh, 35 feet around any of the areas where the hot work's going on clear from flammable material. And if uh, hot work has to, it has to be done in an area where there's, let's say, um, at vintage facilities where they have, like, say, propane cylinder fill stations, if you're doing hot work near one of those areas and you're also required to actually, you know, cover them with fire blankets or something to prevent them from being exposed to this hot sparks, fire, any ignition sources. So there's a lot to that in particular, guys. <clears throat> and this is probably something that uh, everybody's seen at this point. You guys have probably all seen the fire exits being blocked by uh, a shopping carts at different locations. Another thing that stores tend to do, the closer they're getting to a closing time, they usually start blocking off different exits to keep people from coming in which uh, really shouldn't be done because if anything were to happen, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to evacuate an entire store through one or two exits. So fire exits and exits in general shouldn't ever be blocked. <laughs> Advertisement in the way of uh, extinguishers. Again, these extinguishers, in order to have access to them, they can't be blocked by anything. So the general requirements is Extinguishers have to be clear in all directions and at least three feet in every direction, okay, 36 inches. And then, uh, uh, yeah, if, if there's a fire, uh, good luck hopping the fence and trying to get to that extinguisher. There's nothing, and it, it looks like it's so dusty, it probably hasn't been inspected or looked at. You can even see, you can barely see that sign, too. <laughs> yeah, the, guys, um, as the signs tend to fade away, like if you keep them outside, obviously, or I've seen also people store them in like a red bag outside on poles and things like that. Note that the, ba the bags are going to tend to fade away. Replace them after they lose their color because after a while they'll look pink or orange and people may, may not know exactly what's inside of that bag. Okay, so keep those things uh, nice, neat, and updated so people know exactly what it is. And don't block access to them. <clears throat> so in case of fire, what these, what these signs are basically telling you to do is kind of run towards that corner, but it's okay. <laughs> it's a fireproof corner, guys, so you'll make it. But um, no, in all seriousness, this can cause some confusion, but, you know, really what it's trying to say is just choose a door. Either one of the doors may be a fire exit. Hopefully that's what it is, because obviously I don't really understand what's, what, where this is or when they took the picture. Ah, there we go. Now, uh, what type of fire can we put out that this does? What type of extinguisher is this? This would be a class A extinguisher. Now, how much of a fire do you think you could put out with uh, essentially two cups of water? Not very much, guys. So, um, yes, once you use an extinguisher, you kind of have to replace it, but this wouldn't be a, a way of replacing your extinguisher. <coughs> do you guys see any humor in this picture here? The irony. <laughs> yeah, there's, so this uh, building, I'm not sure if it's the actual A&M Fire Safety, it looks like it was a building just touching or adjoined to that uh, fire safety store. But yeah, the, the building next to the fire safety store, fire extinguisher replaced, burned down. And then, um, yeah, I don't know who, who approved that, but yeah, they put a fire valve, what looks like on a stairway, and um, there's no way you can have access to that fire valve. 